from Wakefield, it's the Nolan Cart Night Show, star Nolan. Why are you joining Nolan's guest this week, Kenny Green, to the program? And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's Nolan. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the podcast. And man, oh man, if if you're a fan of basketball, A10 basketball, more specifically, you're right, basketball, even though they didn't make it this year, they're still the better team than PC or Bryant <laughs> or where it is. Even if it, the statistics didn't show this year, but anyways, th- this to end season five with this guest, I could have never, I couldn't have pictured a better ending. He's the one and only, the incomparable Kenny Green. Kenny, how are you doing today? Good, good in yourself, Nolan. We're we're making a bite. It's St. Patrick's Day today. The the days are getting longer. Is. We we can't complain <laughs> about that. So w- sure the, women, can't. Sure U- can't. the URI women's teams in the NIT tomorrow. So we're we're rock and roll to to see that, which I'd like to get your take on, but. Like anything, like the last two years, they've been some interesting times. Now we're going to three years in the current world. So at this point, all these th- these last few years later, how how are you dealing with this whole thing, and how is life for you? Life for me as well. Um, I'm enjoying myself. Um, I have my own training program um, here in Connecticut, which I do um, weekly. Um, normally four to five days a week. Um, and I enjoy it. I really enjoy what I'm doing and I'm having fun doing it. Excellent. That's, uh, I'm glad to hear that, that you're able to have something during these weird times that yeah. are uncertain. Um, how much of it was affected early on in the pandemic? Was it, did it have a great, did the pandemic have, pandemic have a great effect on it early on? Um, I was lucky. Um, I actually trained out of a, um, Catholic school, okay. well, a Catholic, a Catholic church um, gymnasium. So I went to the um, priest of the church and I talked to him and I told him that, you know, I would go through all precautions needed to make sure that before anyone stepped into the gym, that everyone was healthy, everyone, no, no sure. symptoms or anything like that. And, you know, he went back to the archdiocese, talked to the archdiocese about it. And they agreed. So I was able to continue throughout it. And it was a good thing that I was able to because um, <clears throat> I have five middle school kids. And it was great to be able to get them out of the house instead of being sure. stuck in the house throughout yeah. this whole thing. Um, and so that was great for them. And it was great for me to, you know, got gave me a chance to get out of the house on a daily basis. Yeah. So it, it was good. I was lucky. I was very lucky. I'm um, sure. Well, um, but since um, November, I think it was, or before Thanksgiving in Wakefield, Rhode Island, uh, at our rec center, I've been doing this after school program for middle school kids okay. across the street from our, the middle school and then elementary school kids. And it, it's been a great thing because it gives them opportunity to get out of the house sure. and it doesn't have them on the screens all day like they did at the beginning of the pandemic and still taking the precautions, the mask. And of course, you know, people complaining, parents complain about that, but you know, I always said, you know, it's better than being inside all day and being on the screens because this is great. Is. But, you know, being able to see sports and movies and all that other stuff, sure. concerts in person is a great thing. Well, on, on another note, now I want to get to the, the entertaining stuff, basketball. You know, like, like life, there have been a lot of ups and downs and negatives and positives the last three years for the entire world. Similar to URI basketball, unlike years prior, though, the women's team has, you know, had a successful and historic season this year. Like I said there, in, in decades that, since they've last been really relevant, sure. they, they made the NIT tournament. What does this do for Rhode Island basketball? Maybe not even just for the women's team, but URI basketball for, to see this happen again. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations have to be sent out to Coach Reese. She's done a phenomenal job with um, coming in, coming into a situation where, as we all know, the women's team was really down. They had been down for numerous years. Um, She stepped right in and from day one just started pushing and the results have shown. um, I think what it does for the school itself is it's just going to bring a lot more recognition to URI. Sure. Um, URI was known as not nationwide, but, you know, more on a Northeast standard. We were sure. known as a basketball, we're known as a basketball school. 
Um, you know, we've had numerous runs in the tournament and stuff like that, even though they might be spread out you sure. know, a couple of years here, we missed a couple of years, but um, I believe from just f- from my research that that's where a lot of the revenue for the athletics comes from. And it's from basketball. And it was sure. constantly from men's basketball. So it's great for women. Um, it's great for her. Um, and it's great for the school. It was you know, clear and everyone knew of it when it happened, but similar thing, you know, happened when Dan Hurley came in, stepped in and took over for Jimmy Barron, where he comes sure. in and, you know, a, a, a slow start a little bit, you know, a down year, maybe the first year or two. Sure. And then he builds the program up and then he leaves and goes to UConn because of a bigger monetary thing or bigger market. With the success Tam Reese is having this fast, do you see that same thing happening or do you see her being someone who stays around for a long time? You know, along with many of the other alumni, um, we would hope that she would stay. But, you know, she's a young head coach. Sure. You know, this is – so she has to look out for herself. And yeah. like any in any situation, um, there's always stepping stones. So you always want to get to that highest step to prove your ability. So I'm sure that after she's done with the NIT, there's going to be a lot of big name schools coming, yeah. calling and talking to her. Um, it's just going to have to be to the point where, you know, your RI is going to have to throw a bunch of money at her. Sure. I mean, to keep her. I mean, and with what she's done with the women's program and what she's still doing, if they don't, they'd be silly. Yeah. Well, it's similar to, uh, I think, in the situation, Bryant, last night, they played in the, uh, the first four in game. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on who it was. Um, but, oh, Wright State. And a guy who's Wright done State. a guy who's done very well recently with the program the last two years especially, but you see the different level of talent and programs. And he's sort of, now, don't get me wrong, I'm no analyst, I'm not a professional, but he's almost getting to that point where he's reaching the limit with what he can maybe do with the program in order to, you know, make that next step. Now, you know, his name's been thrown around with URI and UMass and other schools that make that next step, but it's going to be interesting. I want to ask you about that. It's coaching rumors about Archie Miller being the next head coach for URI. What he's played for, he coached for Dane was very successful there. Indiana, Thoughts on him, seeing as that's a big name that brings in a lot of attention. Um, I don't know much about him. And, you know, once I started hearing his name being thrown around, you know, and within the last day or two, I started doing a little research, you know, coming to find out that he, you know, he's been out of coaching for a year. So coming into URI, he's going to have to build um, the program from ground up basically because yeah. now he's not coming from a school where, okay, he got fired this year. He's stepping right into a job again. So he might have recruits. He may have players that want to come with him. So I think that's going to be a big step for him. If that, if that is the case, if they do bring him in. Um, and then with the guys, um, the current players who have put themselves and their names into the transfer portal, um, it's going to be up to him if he decides yeah. that he wants to keep him. Sure. You know, so I believe that if, as I think any coach does, when he goes into a new situation, having players that he knows or players that he's recruited, he's going to try to bring those players with him. And then these guys who have put their names into the portal, if they don't fit his criteria, then, um, you know, it's his decision. I don't know if you saw this, but I remember seeing it on online social media, but then also on Entertainment Tonight in a piece. Lamar Odom was on there talking about something, and he said that he wanted to be the next head coach of the program to bring the Miami defense to there. How much how much silliness is that sort of notion that, you know, he thinks he's going to be the head coach? Well, you know, it's great, the aspiration that he has. Um but first of all, it, it, would, it could never happen because he doesn't have a college degree, sure. so he can't be a Division one coach without a college degree. But to have him possibly on a staff, because he does have great ties with NBA teams, and, I mean, it could be beneficial. Or, you know, 
you know, sad to say, but he's going through a lot of troubling times in his life. Sure. So to know if those things are completely behind him, you would never know until yeah. basically you had to deal with it. So, but I mean, for me, it's great that he has the aspiration that he wants to be a coach. And I think just like so many of us, you've got to start somewhere. Sure. So um, if this doesn't pan out for him, I would just say to him, um, you know, go look at high schools, go look at middle schools, go look at whatever. Just try to start, get your foot in the door yeah. and start there and then, you know, see what happens from there. Well, the, and um, I don't know how much, you know, his – even when he was at URI, I know that he wasn't someone who was, I think, in the classroom a lot. I think he was more basketball strictly, which I know David Cox had really stressed education and how he was proud yeah. of his guys on sure. the team that were doing that. And that's, you know, something you should sure. care about. Um, and speaking of basketball, obviously there were a lot of negatives this past season. There were some positives, some bright spots. What can you take away from this past season that you saw that was a positive thing? If there's, if there's one. Um, positive wise, you know, um, I'm happy that the majority of the fans stuck with the team. Yeah. Even going through such turbulent times, um, you know, did kind of slack off toward the end of the season. You know, we started seeing a, a lull in attendance and stuff like that. But that comes with any sport. You know, if your team's not doing well, people, get, fans get upset. Fans get kind of iffy about going. So um, for that, the fans just staying with the team as much as possible. That was, to me, that was such a good thing. What, from your perspective, um wasn't connecting, you know, the success Hurley brought to the program and the energy and the, the, the passion. Sure. The, the, his, his successor had that as well to a degree, but what from your perspective wasn't connecting? Well, you know, as a former player, both collegiate and professional, you know, there was so much talk about, you know, Coach Cox didn't do this. Coach Cox didn't do this. He didn't do this. You know, and there's only so much blame that you can put on a coach. Sure. As a player, you've got to have that will and a desire for to step on the floor night in and night out and just bust your hump and do everything possible to win games. And then when you're not doing something well, okay, I had an off night. I didn't shoot the ball well. I didn't shoot free throws well. Well, then that gives you the opportunity to get in the gym outside of practice and get those shots and get those reps up so the next game you feel a lot more comfortable. I mean, it just shows that for me, I was a little bit more critical of the players. Sure. Because I just felt that they just didn't – there was just no fight and no sure. fire in these yeah. kids. You know, when with Coach Hurley, um, he's a very vocal yeah. coach. Sure. So he's that he's that up in your face. He's going to scream. He's going to yell at you where Coach Cox wasn't that way. Sure. So the players took on Coach Coach Hurley's um, demeanor, whereas it just looks like these coach these kids took on Coach Cox's demeanor. Where sure. if there was a bad player turn or whatever else, it was like okay, whatever it, yeah. it is, what it is. So I mean, it it just seems like they just this team took on Coach Cox's persona. And to say that they didn't have that fire, that fight, it's impossible to say. It, it's just what it looked, it looked sure. like from the outside looking in. And, you know, you wish that you had, <clears throat> even if it was that one player who somebody screwed up, you know, is in somebody's face sure. yelling at them, you know, we got to get it together, let's go. It just didn't seem like they had that. Well, and I think from from a fan's perspective, and I, I give myself at least two passes from a game, depending on what my uh, weekly sure. schedule is with club tennis and whatnot. And it's hard, you know, seeing this as someone who went to a lot of games to see a lot of guys on the team who weren't veteran members of this team who hadn't been there since day one. You know, I know you had Jeremy Shepard, but there was no one like a Jeff Dowen or a Sir Langevin who had been there all four years, graduated from yeah. there. And were those guys who they could see stuff's going to hit the fan and they're going to do what they can. 
Now, if they can, that's another thing. But it, that's, that's hard to do, and it's unfortunate to see because there is, there is some talent on that team. Unfortunately, some of it's leaving, but that's, you know, another thing. Now, if let's, – let's, let's, let's say, you know, we know – how long his contract was or how long uh, he was there for what he could have been there for. If let's say the transfers who left last year, Tyrese Martin, Obi Toppin's brother, and some of the other guys stayed around, stayed, stayed here as long as being able to keep some of the current guys that they achieved on the team. Do you think he still would have been here at URI or would he, you know, gone, you know, no matter what? You know, that's a what if question. And what if questions, it can go either way. You know, sure. there's no guarantee, you know, with those guys, let's look at it. I mean, honestly, Tyrese Martin is the only kid who's had really real big success sure. leaving the program and going to another school. Um, the topping kid, you know, he's actually, he's playing right now. Um, he hasn't had that big of an impact. Yeah. In Kentucky. So, you know, to say that if these kids stayed, would things have been different? Would there have been a bigger turnaround? Would it, you know, would they have won more games? It's possible. Of course it's possible. Um, but then it's also possible that they may not have meshed with the kids coming in, with yeah. the group of kids that had to come in and stuff like that. So it could have still been the same situation or even worse. So who knows? I'm, I'm also curious, you know, you played with Tommy Garrick, who was a homegrown kid in Rhode Island from mm-hmm. West Warwick. Sebastian Thomas from uh, the state as well. What are your hopes to see him as a player? I mean, it, I don't know if he's going to stay or leave now that a lot of these players are leaving as well. What do you hope that he does not only as a player himself, but for the program, seeing as you played with someone from Rhode Island? Yeah. Well, you know, I would hope that he stays because he's going to have a great opportunity to flourish there. Um, he's raw. He's young. He, he has a, he has to he has a lot a lot of work ahead of him on his game. Um, he's got a very high basketball IQ. But what's going to keep him held back is if he doesn't work on his shot. You know, the kid he it just seen games where he was very hesitant to shoot the ball because he just had no confidence in his shot. To work on that and to get better at that. I see no no reason why he wouldn't flourish in that in, in in the program, regardless of who's the coach. I mean, like I said, he, he's his basketball IQ is very high, and you can see it from him playing. Um, he's a true point guard. So, um, hopefully, he would stay. And you know, there hasn't been another homegrown player from Rhode Island yeah. at URI, you know, that would have the opportunity such as you know, that Tommy did. So, I mean, he could be the next guy in that situation, sure. but it's just, it's just work. You know, it depends on how much work you want to put into it, how, how much better he wants to get. Well, and, and that, you know, is, is very true from my perspective, looking at, it because, you know, yeah, you see all these guys leaving and that stinks, but he has the opportunity to realize, Hey, these guys are leaving. That's their choice, but I have the opportunity sure. to play more. Because I, sure. I remember seeing during the season where he may commit a turnover or two and make a bad pass, and then he'd get upset. Then Coach uh, yeah. Cox would sub him out very quickly. Um, yeah. But I think now he can now he should realize that hey, that's last year. Now I have this opportunity to really help, and I may it may be a rough start, it may be a rough go, may struggle at first, but we have the growth, and there's loads of loads of experience. Uh, I'm curious in your perspective on on this next question and correct me at if I'm wrong at all at during it I, from my perspective and I've seen this at the school there seems to be a lot and maybe across the board as well where players and it's evident you're right where they leave and they care more about their future instead of the team's future that they're committed to and they leave because they're not getting the minutes or the success that they think they should do and whereas you see you know maybe during your time where you have players across the board, the stat sheet looks pretty even. And there's not these players who have these humongous egos where it's all about them and they're worried about the team pushing forward. Have you have you seen that similar situation in this day and age with basketball? And how do you how do you change that and where did it go wrong? Oh, without a doubt. It's it's just this generation of kids. I mean, it's a generation of me, me, me. Um how do you change it? 
<laughs> it's a good question. Um, but for any player, for any player going to play college basketball, your next goal after that is to get to the NBA or to get overseas somewhere that you can make money and make a living doing what you love doing. So um, to have a player who isn't playing a lot in college for whatever reason it may be, um, some of these players leaving, it's warranted. Some of these players leaving, it's not. Um, my main thinking, my thinking about this is if you've played and you're averaging 20, 25 minutes a game and you go through a whole season averaging 25 minutes a game, but you don't produce while you're on the floor. Yeah. And then you decide, oh, well, I want to leave to go to another school, whatever else. See, for me, you not producing has nothing to do with a coach, has nothing to do with other players. That has to do with your exactly. ability. So what makes you believe that by going to another school, now all of a sudden everything's going to change? Now, there are exceptions to every rule, of course. But the majority of the time, no, it's you're leaving because you didn't produce in a time that you had where you were. Sure. So to go to somebody else, go somewhere else to me that's a cop out but you know it's to me it's just generation and then when the ncaa opened up that you know these kids can move basically freely from school to school it makes it a little bit more difficult for coaches well besides the obvious skill difference from that you know specifically that 87 88 team is that what's separates saying as that team had four players in the four players during that season who had double had a uh, double digit scoring compared to nowadays where you have a lot of these players who it's not the case where they're more team ball. Well, for me, we enjoy playing with each other. And that's what I tell everybody. I said, you know, regardless of like, okay, so we had, let's say our starting five, Tommy, Tommy Garrett, Silk Owens, Bonzi Colson at center, John Evans at one forward, Mervyn Cena at the other forward. And then I would come off the bench. We enjoyed playing with each other. Yeah. There was never – we, myself, Bonzi, John, Mergen, we knew who the big dogs on the team were. We knew it was Tommy Garrick and Silver Owens. So we knew that we were the compliments to them. Sure. But we also we also knew and understood that they weren't selfish players. Sure. So we knew that, you know, it would be easy for us to average double figures because there would there would always be so much attention put to those guys. So all we had to do was produce when that attention was put to them. And our life would be a little bit easier. So there was never any animosity toward Tommy or Silk from us because we we legitimately enjoyed playing with these guys because we knew that they were great players. We knew that, you know, yeah, they're going to average 20 points a night. And we were, we were all gung-ho for that, you know. They're going to average 20 points a night. Teams are going to start to double-team them. Teams are, teams are going to start to pressure them. So that's going to leave us open for layups, open shots, stuff like that. So we were basically, we were going to get the scraps, but yeah. we were going to get those scraps, but we were going to produce with those scraps sure. and we were fine. And we were fine with that. Well, that's, you know, determination, grit, will to win everything Al Davis sure. you know, spoke about and preached about. And I think that's something that's, as we talked about earlier with the Jeff Downs and the thrills that is sort of missing right now. But I, I want to now talk about and sort of have the remainder of this interview with yourself about your time with basketball. Growing up in Connecticut, what was basketball like, but also in terms of having aspirations post high school in terms of playing basketball? Well, you know, growing up, I wasn't a basketball kid. I was a baseball kid. I loved baseball. Um, probably up until my sophomore year in high school, I was just more focused on baseball. Um, my junior year to my senior year, I grew six inches over the summer. Oh, wow. <laughs> but, you know, I would go to the park with all my friends and we would play and stuff like that. And I knew I was decent. You know, I wasn't anything special. I just knew I was decent. Um, but I love playing the game. Sure. And, um, so, but my main focus was baseball. You know, um, getting the opportunity to play college basketball was something that 
wasn't in the back of my wasn't in the back of, of my mind. You know, I was more or less looking at maybe I can go play college baseball. You know, um, but once the opportunity came, uh, I see I was going to seize the moment. You know, it was just it was a blessing. Um, I was pleased and I was happy about it. Um, it just showed me that somebody had faith in my ability, and for someone to show that faith in my mind it was just to the point where I just couldn't let that person down. So I'm, I was happy about it. You know, I don't, you know, driving around cities now and stuff like that. You know, I go, I, I purposely drive past parks and stuff like that. For me, when we were growing up, we were in a park every day. Sure. You know, like I said, if I wasn't playing baseball, I was playing basketball, but we were in a park every day. Nowadays, you don't see that. You yeah. know, if you see if you see people in the park, it's always older guys. Yeah, <laughs> it's older people. You don't see that that 14, 15, 16 year old um, daily in a park working on their game, yeah. playing and stuff like that. But that's how we were. You sure. know, even though we did have gyms, but you know, it was just we just preferred to be outside playing in the park because we would always end up playing with older guys, and we knew that you know playing with older guys for one. If you didn't perform, you weren't going to play. Yeah. <laughs> so, and playing with older guys, you know, older guys are tough. You know, if they don't like what you're doing, they're going to get you right out of there. Of so, course. but I mean, it 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 pushed me to be a little bit better than I thought I could be. And um, but I just don't see that now. I don't see that in this generation. Yeah. Now uh, I talked about this with <laughs> T.J. Buchanan and. Sebastian and then Kevin Sutton, the former assistant coach for the program, mm-hmm. about the moment they saw, and you sort of talked about how you it was a little later in high school where you basketball came more prevalent. But I asked them, what moment or was there a moment? I'm curious if there's one for you where you realized what you had with basketball. And I know you just said baseball, but basketball where your skill level or something you had with basketball, a trait you had was far superior than others where you realized that there was something there that you had. Um, yeah, it was probably my senior year in high school. Um, the coach at the time for URI was Brendan Malone. And him, he and his wife came down to recruit because they were recruiting um, our wingman, which was actually, he was a, a five-star player. He was, um, he was getting recruited by everybody, Georgetown, Syracuse. Um, I mean, very good player. And they came down to see him. And our coach came in the locker room. And it was the first time that he had ever done it. And he said that there's a, co- there's, there's a few college scouts in the, in the stands today. And we all knew that they were coming to see our teammate. Yeah. But my point guard said to me, <laughs> and I'll never forget it to this day. God bless his soul. He passed um, away about 10 years ago. But he said to me, he said, look, <clears throat> neither one of us have anything. So how about we go out there and put on a show for some of these guys of and course. see what happens? Yeah. And when he said that, you know, something just in my brain clicked. Um, on their way home, I mean, I, I had a monster game. I had like 20 and I had like 20 and 20 and like eight blocks. And um, on the way home, his wife actually called my mother <laughs> and told my mom that they were interesting, interested in seeing me play a little bit more and they were going to keep in contact and follow me a little bit more. And when my mother ever told me that, you know, that I think that was the defining moment for me that I had something. Uh, that must have been interesting. I mean, a, a, a husband-wife coach duo that was recruiting players, because I don't know how often, I don't know if Dan Hurley did that or <laughs> David Cox did that, but that must have been interesting because I – I believe it was with Nathan Mook when you were on his thing, the roadie vault or whatever it's, yeah. it's called where you had mentioned that where your mother and the uh, Malone's wife had contacted and they said, Oh, you're going to your and you had no knowledge of that. And you were already um, going there. Now, I don't know how exact or specific basketball references the website, but I was doing research. It said you were there in 85 and 86. Um, yeah. What was that like going from high school? You just mentioned a 20 and 20 game, the unbelievable stat line to then going to URI and you're then having to, you know, wait your time to provide a, a big impact for the team. 
Well, for me, my freshman year, when I got on campus 85, um, it was a little bit of culture shock. Um, but I didn't play my freshman year. Um, I, li- I broke my thumb oh boy. Five, days be- five days before the beginning of the season. Uh. So Coach Malone decided to redshirt me. And when he called me in his office to tell me that, like I had no idea what it meant. But he basically told me, well, you're not going to play this year, but you'll still have four years of play. So we're just going to rehab, you know, you're going to get your thumb better and then you're just going to work out practice with the team and stuff like that and just get stronger and get better. Um, so that was, it was tough for me watching the guys who I had come on my freshman year with, watching them play. It was a little tough, but I understood the process um, finally and understood what I needed to do to make sure that I'd be ready to, the next year to immediately impact the team and and help the program and stuff like that. So it was tough, but it was what it is. Um, I was glad that I registered it and I didn't lose that year um, because it helped me out tremendously. Now, unlike my father, I wasn't able to experience seeing that as a high school kid that his age, but I'm, I'm curious when you were, um, uh, when he was looking to um, have you come to the team um, Malone, what was your viewpoint or knowledge of what your ice basketball was up until that point? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. I had, let's put it this way. I knew, I knew where Rhode Island was. I knew nothing of URI. Um, and like I said to Nathan, I was being recruited by, Smaller schools, sure. Um, but I was I had a lot of interest from Wake Forest at the time. All right. But because my mother and Coach Malone's wife, yeah, made made such a great friendship with each other, she invited my mother and my aunt up to the school to see the school, All right. to see Neil Gazette and to see South Kingston, and they came back from their recruiting trip. <laughs> And literally told me, this is where you're going to go to school at. Well, There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. You have no say-so in it. <laughs> um, we're going to sign a letter of intent tomorrow. And I was like, okay. You well, know, that, so, that, that, that's something you you have. Yeah, I, I give you props for that, to have no <laughs> view of your eye, knowing at least where it is. Because there's some people my age nowadays who think it's, part, uh, think it's an actual island, a part of Long Island, or... They don't know what it is, but to come into this and be ready to invest in it is an unbelievable thing. Well, the following year, 86, 87, uh, new head coach, Penders, comes in. You guys go from 8-20, and 2-16 and 16 in the conference, to then 20-10 and 10 and 12-6 and six and third in the conference. What was that cultural change, or not culture, culture change, like from your perspective, where now you're scoring more? You're putting up more rebounds, but also blocks and making it to then the NIT. Two totally different coaches. Um, Coach Malone was a was a physical grind grind out to the last second. Um, we're going to play defense. We're going to we're going to shut teams down. Where when Coach Penders came, he was like completely opposite. He said, "We're just going to score more points than everybody. <laughs> That's how we're going to win games." Yeah, I want you to play defense, but I want to score more points than everybody else. And I want to average 80 points a game, minimum. And for the guys that were there and for the team that we had, he literally saw that we were a up-tempo team. So with his style of play, which he had brought from every other school that he was at, um, it fit perfectly with us. So it was easy. It was a lot easier for our team at that point in time. Plus, you know, everybody had matured a year. Sure. Everybody was a little bit more pocket, a little bit more understanding of what they needed to do individually to help the team play. So that made things a lot easier. And then it, it didn't hurt having players like Tommy and Silk, you know, right there with you to help you along the way and to for the guidance that they gave us. Well, that must have been a, a relieving thing to know that they were back again another year after mm-hmm. you were on the bench and you were waiting to get back in. But I'm also curious, you know, how early on that season where 
you the complete turnaround for the team and then you make the NIT. How early on in that season did you realize that there was something special here with Pe- Tom Penders as the coach? Oh, right away, right away. Um, the, the first probably the first week of practice. Um, just the atmosphere in the locker room is completely different. Um, everybody was a lot looser. Um, there was a lot more joking and playing going along, um, going around. And when we stepped on the floor, you just, you can see the difference in everybody's performance, um, on a day in and day out basis. So, um, it was just the it was just the philosophy that he brought to the team. It was his persona that he brought to the team, and I truly believe that teams take on the persona of their coach. All right. Um. And his persona was, you know, if if you and you have it, maybe your dad may have, but if anybody was ever around this guy, you would see. I mean, just laid back, <laughs> fun loving guy. Um, and that's how he was on a daily basis with us. And we literally adapted to that, that he put it, he put in our minds that he didn't care who we were playing against, that we were better than them. I mean, we would legitimately say to, you know, we know we're not better than this team, but you would never hear us say that because his mindset was, and he was, he was pushing toward us that we're better than that team. We can play with that team. We can beat that team. And we carried that persona on when we started playing. Well, I know Silk had is, is, did an interview with Nathan as, as well. He yeah. mentioned something that uh, Tommy uh, Pender said in the locker room before the Missouri game that I'll ask you about late in a little bit. But um, I, I, I want to ask you this. With the success that you had, and we have been talking about the last few seconds or minutes, the success that you had achieved was – were you able to tell that after that moment that next year is going to be the team's year and that there's so much potential of dominance that your team can do the following years? Well, you know, um, we believe that even that year that we got kind of slighted by the NCAA, that we felt that we were an NCAA team that year just from our record and the way that we had played in the, in the conference and stuff like that we felt that we should have made the NCAA. So we knew that, okay, so the NIT is a step down from that. Sure. We were upset, but then we were also happy because nobody nobody had been to an NIT before. So it was still postseason play. Sure. So we were happy that we were in postseason play, but we, we really felt that we should have, you know, made it to the, you know, to the um, tournament. So we knew that that coming that following year, that there was no way that we were going to allow them to take that away from us, and that was the mindset that we actually had. I mean, that's how we talked to each other. They slighted us this year. We're not going to allow that to happen next year. Well, the following year, which is a historic year, everyone knows about, and besides, maybe the mm-hmm. the ninety eight season is probably the eighty eight or eighty seven eighty eight season, probably one of the most the greatest seasons that you guys had in terms of ba- men's basketball. No, but let he, me stop you there. Then let me stop you there. The '98 season, nobody's still broken our record for the most wins. Well, hey, I, they, I, had I, a, they had a, they had a great season that '98 season. Oh, sure. great, great season. But sure. they, nobody has still come. They still haven't broken our record for the most wins, uh, and that's something that I'm extremely proud of. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take that away, and we can, we we can also talk about another another uh, record that you have. Um, but we'll probably. The, the most successful, then I, I'll correct myself, the most successful, most well-known season that the program has had, you know, Penders, Penders, uh, Penders is back for a second season. You have your back, Garrick and Silk are there still. Four players, including yourself, are averaging a double, uh, double-digit double scoring. How far before the season started did you think or did you see that this team can, you know, make a big impact this year finally? How's the honest truth? We knew that. I mean, our goal was to win the A-10. Our goal was, I mean, and it, as silly as it might sound, our goal was that we truly believe that we can win a national title. We honestly, I mean, and it, people used to look at us like some of the some of the kids on campus, because we would sit there and say, oh, we're going to win a national title. 
Sure. We have a team that's going to win a national title. And, you know, they would look at us, oh, my God, you know, you've got North Carolina, you've got Duke, you've got this one and this one. We're like, we don't care. We believe that we can win a national title. And that's the mentality that we brought into that season. And we truly believe it. Well, that's, that's something that I would hope, you know, is brought back mentality-wise for the program. But the, the thing I just mentioned earlier about what Penders had said in the locker room before the Missouri game, and this is this is what um, it said, apparently, according to what it said in the video, but Penders said, F the announcers and we're going to kick Missouri's ass. Now, did you expect that coming from Penders? Because you said how yeah. mellow he was and not, you know, but he, you know, was determined and stuff like that. What was that like to experience that situation where he's, you know, saying that? Oh, no, we've, you know, we had gotten glimpses of that throughout the season. Um, if we didn't beat a team the way that he expected us to beat a team. Um, but even before we stepped foot on a plane to go to play down at Chapel Hill, he had sat there and told us, you know, in a gym, nobody gives us a chance. Nobody knows where we're from. Nobody has ever heard of URI. Nobody knows anything. Nobody gives, nobody's given us a chance yeah. whatsoever. They've got high, everybody else has high profile players that are predicted to be one, two, three, four, five in the draft. So we don't have any of that. So nobody's given us a chance. He said, but it's the same philosophy from day one. We don't care who we're playing. We're going to go and we're going to, excuse my language, we're going to whoop somebody's ass <laughs> and we're going to do it regardless of who it is. And so when he walked in the locker room, we knew it was his way of kind of firing us up for the game. But he also knew that he didn't have to be, have to because we were already ready to play. We were ready to play from the time that we got on the plane to the time we got off the plane to the time we stepped on the floor. He knew we'd be ready to play. The type of environment that Penders created in his only two years that he was there and the type of persona that he had is that what you look for in a college coach is that what you expect out of a college coach to be coaching a program such as you or I or any other big program well you know, no because you know every coach is different you know just as every human is different um so but you know if you have a coach that's very laid back and has a really calm demeanor to me personally, you need an assistant coach who's complete opposite. Sure. You know, you might not, you, you know, your head coach might not be that in your face type of guy, but then you also need somebody on the bench who's going to be that type sure. of guy that if there's a mistake made on the floor, he's the first one off the bench. He's chasing you down the floor, basically, you know, let you know you screwed up. Um, so for me, there has to be that yin and yang right. in, on your coaching staff. You know, it, it can't be everybody's the same, that same kilter of character back and forth because, you know, especially if it's that calm demeanor, then, you know, when mistakes are made and nothing's being said about it right there on the floor, you know, kids today kind of take that as a, okay, I can continue doing what, sure. whatever I'm doing. Uh, there's no repercussion for it, you know, at least right then and there. Whereas even with Penders, you know, if you, okay, let's say for Penders, if you didn't, I mean, we ran and we ran and we ran. So if there was a fast break and you were kind of dogging it on a fast <laughs> break, oh, he let you know right then and there. And, you know, you would expect that for a coach okay, he's going to get at me for a lapse in the defensive assignment or something like that. No, for him, it was a lapse in the offense. <laughs> if you had a lapse in the offense, he was in your face. He was right, you know, he, you were coming right out the game. And as soon as you sat down, he's knelt in front of you and he's giving you an ear for <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's just, as far as coaching, and I just think that you have to have a yin and yang sure. in coaching because if everybody's the same, I don't think that's beneficial to the players. Now I, I know in watching the, the your your interview with or discussion with Nathan on his stuff and talking about the run and everyone knows what happened and but that Missouri game I'm, I'm curious you know Shivas had that big that big performance thirty plus points and I know that and also had mentioned that Penders had said I don't give a shit who's covering him how many people cover him he's not scoring fifty points or I don't care if he scores fifty points they're not beating us 
what in that situation when you're dealing with that, and that's maybe a, a thing that players deal with nowadays. When you're dealing with a player like himself, who's a talented, I'm sure, but also putting in big numbers, how how do you deal with that and try to be better than that player in the game? Well, you know, for that game, literally, I think everybody who played their game guarded their chiefs that night, and he still scored on everybody. <laughs> He was just he was just that type of player that you know he he pretty much did whatever he felt whatever he wanted to do so we understood that okay he's gonna get this 30 35 whatever it may be now we're just gonna shut down everybody else sure. so we're not gonna allow him to get 30 and then the next guy to get 20 the next guy to get 30 or uh, 25 whatever it may be so we're, we're seeing we can't – we've thrown every junk defense, everything at this kid. He's still scoring. We're like, okay, fine. But at some point in time, he's going to get tired. Yes. So we're not going to allow somebody else to beat us off, you know, at that point in time. And that's the mentality that we took there. Penders was only there for two years after being replaced by assistant coach um, Al Skinner. Do you wish Penders stayed longer given the success that you guys just accomplished that year? Oh, without a doubt. Um, we loved his system. We loved his style of play. Um, but it was okay because Coach Skinner was stepping in. Sure. And he had been, from my freshman year, he had been there and stuff like that. So um, we knew what kind of coach he was. Sure. Because, I mean, as much as Penders was in the, as much as Penders was in the forefront, he was, Al was practice. He was the main guy practice. You know, he was the one calling all the shots and sure. practice and stuff like that. So we knew what type of um, play, what type of coach Al was going to be. So we, I was okay with that. I was okay. You know, Al, I understood what he expected of me and what he wanted from me. And um, so did the other guys. So we were okay with that. But, you know, of course we would have loved for uh, Coach Pendens to stay. Um but, you know, we also understood what he was doing and why he did it sure. and what he had to do. So Now, in life, whether it's basketball or whatever the situation may be that you're in, you know, everyone, I think, seeks a level of validation from whether it's others or your inner self or family, what may it be. Regardless of how that, that season ended where you played Duke and lost, is that is the length that you made it towards, is that what gives – did that give you validation in terms of – Man, I made it this far, and I'm uh, I'm near the top, basically. No, because if as a player, your mentality is in, especially on a college level, to win a national championship, then not to do that, you fall short of your goal. Sure. And if you don't, and if you don't have that goal, then you shouldn't be playing college basketball or that, you know, for whatever whatever level that you're on. Um. Losing to Duke was probably one of the hardest losses I've ever had in my career because we knew that we should have beat them. We knew and that we were better than them. Um, it was a it was a ball a ball dropping here, a ball dropping there, whatever else, or a, a fall here or a fall there. Um, so to lose to them. There was no validation that okay we had a great season whatever else now nah, it was it was heartbreaking because we just knew that and our whole goal was that we knew that if we beat Duke that we had a matchup with Temple again now we had lost to Temple three times that year twice regular season then in the championship game so our whole thing was there's no way in the world that we're gonna allow Temple <laughs> we know each other we know each other in and out. Sure. There's no way we're going to allow them to beat us <laughs> a fourth time this year. And each game that we played them, it was tough. You know, it was close games and stuff like that. So that was our goal. We Our goal was that we had to meet T Temple again. Um, but it didn't happen, you know, um, for whatever reason it may be. You know, everybody has their own philosophy of what happened that game. You know, for me, it was um, Tommy had gotten three fouls in the first half. And they all three fouls are kind of suspect calls. So in our minds, like, well, they're trying to take 
one of our best players off the floor, and it was Duke. Yeah. So that's – but we were like, you know, okay, you take one of them away from – you take one of us out of it, somebody else is going to step up. And everybody else stepped up, you know, and it just – like I said, it just – yeah. You know, we had we had a shot at the end to win, um, but it just didn't happen. Now, Tommy and um, t- Tommy and the other you know talented players that were upperclassmen about to graduate graduate. You're now getting a bigger piece of the team puzzle in terms of leading, but also um, stat wise. What's your mindset after they graduate, and then then you're having to be one of the top guys? Well, you know. When, you know, after that season, you know, Coach Skinner had brought me in his office and he was like, you know, you literally have been a six man your whole time here. And, you know, he said, it's, it has to change. Um, I need more from you, more on the floor from you. I need you on the floor longer and stuff like that. He said, we don't, you know, and it was true. We didn't, you know, he says, we don't have the talent that we had last year. We don't have the full talent that we had two years ago. So, there's going to be so much more expected from you. And I was okay with that. Um, he knew that I, I, at that point in time, up until that point, I wasn't very vocal because I didn't have to be. We had time and so. Sure. So, but, you know, he broke it down where it's to the point where, you know, you had two great guys before you show you how it's done. I need you to follow that lead and continue that. And I took it and I ran with it. I'm, I'm curious in that aspect that, you know, and I think that speaks volumes to the type of player you are and what's missing nowadays is that that's, uh, I mean, evident now where these players are leaving and then you have players who are now here that come back, but they, I don't want to say fall to the situation and crumble, but they don't maybe necessarily step up to help continue the, the program. Um, I was, you, you, you're done in nine, 1990. What was your mindset afterwards in terms of basketball prospects before you went pro? Um, I knew I wanted to continue playing. Um, I knew it was going you know, I had gone to um, pre-draft camp and everything like that. Um, had done well. Um, but I knew it was going to be a long shot NBA wise. I knew just because of my knee, the condition of my knee, I knew it was going to be a long shot. I didn't, you know, talking to talking to my agent who I had hired at that point in time. Um, we had understood that it was going to, it was going to take a special team to take a chance. And we didn't know. Um, so when I got the call, you know, draft day, you know, draft night when my name wasn't called, I was okay with that. But I got a phone call after the draft ended from the Spurs saying, you know, they'd like for me to come in and um, go through their rookie camp and be a part of the rookie camp so they can get a better look at me. So, you know, that, that was a thrill for me. Um, I went down there. I had a great, great camp with them. Um, at that time, Larry Brown was the coach. It was weird because Larry and I both had the same agent. Interesting. So I kind of had a, I kind of had an insight on a yeah. daily basis of, you know, what he was thinking with me and stuff like that. Because you know, my agent would call me after every after every <laughs> workout and stuff like that and tell me, you know, he's pleased with you, he's happy with you. And um, we were in the summer league and we were playing Boston in the summer league and. After the game, on their way back to the hotel, as soon as I get into the hotel, my phone's ringing, and it's my agent. He's like, well, you know, we've got a problem. And I was like, oh, geez, what the hell? He's like, no, it's a good problem. He says, well, they want to bring you back for veterans camp, but it's not going to be guaranteed. I'm like, okay. At this point in time, I'm still – learning the process in the game sure. of what goes on NBA wise. So I'm like, okay, what do you mean it's not guaranteed? Well, there's going to be no guaranteed money. They just want you to come back to veterans camp. He said, but here's what's going on. There was a team from Italy there and they want to sign you to a contract right now. And so he was like, well, what do you want to do? And I'm at this point in time, I have no idea what's going on. I'm like, <laughs> so there's somebody who wants to sign me to a contract now, but 
San Antonio wants to bring me back into for veterans camp. He said, yes, that's exactly what's going on. He said, the guy, the coach was leaving, and the coach at that time for the team in Italy was Mike D'Antoni, okay. who was the, you know, the coach for Houston Rockets for so many years and stuff like that. So he's like, he's going back to Italy in two days. He wants an answer in two days before he goes back. So I said, well, I want to talk to Coach Brown. He's like, fine. So he set up an appointment. He set up a meeting, you know, um, Coach Brown and I sat down. And he, and Coach Brown was like, I mean, just a genuine guy. He was like, I understand what's going on. I know that you have something in hand right now with the team at Italy. He said, but I, I would love for you to come to Veterans Camp because I think you have a good shot. He said, I can't tell you you have a guaranteed shot, but I, he said, I think you have a good shot. He said, but anything is possible. Anything can happen at any point in time. So I said, I literally asked him, what do you think I should do? He said, if I was you and I, if I was in your shoes, he said, I take the guarantee right now. Yeah. And as soon as he said that to me, it just clicked. I said, okay, fine. I said, I appreciate everything you've done for me. But, and I'm going to take, I'm going to take your advice and I'm going to take it. And geez, I signed my contract that night to go over uh -huh. to Italy and play. Do you think, and now th just another hypothetical as, you know, what if, as we said earlier, but if you had gone to the veterans camp and didn't sign with Italy that night, do you think that you were going to make the lineup for the team and make the team after that veterans camp? At that time, they had drafted a center, Dwayne Shinsis. Dwayne came out of Florida. He was a uh, top five pick or something like that to that somewhere around there. Um, and they had two spots. There were two spots open. And I was averaging in the summer league. I was averaging 20 and 10. Wow. So in my mind and just looking at everybody else that, you know, I was on a team playing with us, I was real confident. But when it came down to Coach Brown saying, if I was in your shoes, this is what I would do because it's guaranteed. Yeah. He said, it makes a big difference between being guaranteed and being hopeful. And that stuck with me. So, um, but once I left and once I did take that and then, you know, I never looked back. I never doubted the decision I made was the right decision. I was never, I was never upset that I, chose to go to Europe instead of grinding out to see what would happen in the NBA. Because what would happen is I'd come home in the summer and I played, I played against all these NBA guys down in New York and everything like that. Sure. And I knew I could play with them. I knew, I mean, it was times where, um, there were players who my agent would call me and say, uh, where are you at? And I'd be, and I tell them I'm, you know, such and such a place playing and stuff like that. Well, there's, there's GMs and there's scouts from NBA teams and I've gotten calls about you. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I would say to them, okay, that's great. And that's fine. Are they guaranteeing anything <laughs> at this time? I understood, I understood the business now. Yeah. I'm like, so is, is anything being guaranteed? He's like, uh, yeah, but it's not a lot. It's not what you're making overseas. Sure. And it's guaranteed to come to veterans camp. I'm like, no, I said, if it's not a guaranteed contract, to play for their team, it's not worth it for me. Sure, so. yeah. It's but you spent twelve. You spent over a decade overseas, and I'm sure yeah. you, you you might not have expected that necessarily to have a long <laughs> run like that. And looking back at at that point, I'm sure you may have. I mean, did you have a thing where you uh, in validation in terms of going from high school player who played later in high school, and then you get this letter of intent, you're signing without even being there, and then now you're 12 years as a veteran overseas, could you, was that the, the cream of the crop in terms of validation to yourself after the hard work you put in? I couldn't have scripted it any better. Um, I never envisioned that would be the way that my career would go or would happen. Um, but I was thankful every step of the way. Um, and I wouldn't have traded it for the world. Now, I, I know that after retiring, you did a little coaching, but after that, you know, still, since you played at URI, your name's still up in, in, in the books in terms of 
blocks and rebounds what leading lead uh, the record for blocks and i know that players have been close and you've talked about that and you've talked about how you've had conversations with hassan at that point and then surreal and i know you, you said you know records are meant to be broken but when it wasn't by both players were you still relieved to know that you're still the top dog in that category and that no they didn't break it well what on the doubt <laughs> I'd be I'd be lying if I say that, that I wasn't. Um, with the blocks, you know, um, I knew Hassan was really close. And when I come back home, um, I had met him and we had talked about it and stuff like that. And he was like, "I'm coming, I'm coming." I was like, "Come, go get it." <laughs> I mean, like I said, and I told people, it couldn't have, if it would have happened, it couldn't have happened to a, a better kid. Be, um, I used to watch the kid work and the kid just, just a workhorse, just work, work, work. And even when it came down to surreal Langevin, you know, he was trying, you know, I, I still hold the record for have, excuse me, having a double, double for a full season. Yeah. I think he, I think he was last game of the season. He needed 11 rebounds to, you know, get there. Yeah. And I think he ended up with like eight or something like uh. that. And, you know, I had talked to him. I'm like, listen, I mean, go get it. I mean, it, I tell everybody, records are made to be broken. Sure. If they're broken by kids who generally you appreciate and that you like and they deserve it, you want nothing for the best. But if it doesn't happen, that's just another year that your name's in the record book. Yeah, and that's that's another year to pr- say, hey, I, I'm still top <laughs> dog and no one's, no one's <laughs> taking me. There it is. As, as, as the rock says, just bring it. That's that's what you that's what you gotta say. Now, that's it. That's it, Noah. Now I had Thor on, and you've talked about it many times when I asked him about the situation with jerseys and rafters, and it's been a while since Michelle Washington and Ernie Calvary, I believe it was, and um Frank Keeney. And you know, he gave the same answer you shared with Nathan about how it ha- how it should happen and who would do what and so on and so forth. But if you, if there was some committee and you were part of it and you could give your five cents of who it was, how would you want to see it done? But also, would you rather see it one person each year or would you see a few at the first year and then it's one year, one person each year afterwards? If it was up to me or if I was part of a committee to try to decide this, I would, I would like to see at least three guys a year. I think there's enough history that we can do at least three players a year um, to try to decide who would go first. And I think that's Thor's biggest problem, trying to figure out, Sure. okay, there's been so many players here. How do we decide? Um, and I've even talked to him about this. And I told him, I said, listen, for me, it doesn't make a difference who you put there. Who you I said, for one, we have to do this as a school, as a program. It has to be done. I said, but your first person has to be Carlton Owens. Sure. And he says to me, he says to me, why? I said, he's your all-time leading scorer of yeah. the school. I said, after that, now you can kind of finagle who should, who else should be there, what should happen. Blah. I said, but he should be. No questions asked, no doubt about it. The first person that that name or that jersey is retired. Now, people have talked about, well, should we retire jerseys? Should we retire names, whatever else, or numbers? And an alumni, um, his name's Milan Azar. He said something to me that really kind of hit home. He said, we, why not just retire names? Put your name on a jersey. Retire that, retire that name, your name on that jersey without a number. He said, and then, or even if you retire your name with that number, don't, whereas if a number's retired, nobody can ever use that number again. Sure. No. Allow that number to still be used, but on that number, if a, if a kid chooses that number to play with, there should be a little patch with your initials on that jersey oh, showing, okay. you know. That way, a little bit of respect is paid. The homage is paid to you while that kid's wearing your uniform. And I thought that was—I thought that was pretty powerful that he said that he came up with that with that solution. But 
You know, for me, there's no question about it. I mean, so many people have asked me who's, who, who would be your top five, the first five to be retired and stuff like that. And I said, you know what? It's probably one of the toughest things. And I said, but, you know, if I, if I honestly had to say my top five, I said it would be Carlton Owens, it would be Tommy Garrett, it would be Tyson Wheeler, it would be Sly Williams, and, and Mark Cuban. And everybody's like, well, how do you know about Mark Cuban? I said, well, he's the all-time leading rebounder in school history. All right. I said, oh, he said, well, what about, why do you say Sly? I said, because honestly, I said, and I don't think that these kids do this. I said, but when I got to school and when we were at school, we would watch old films of all the players who came before right. us. I said, and watching Sly Williams play, he was probably, and you know, this this generation knows Lamar Odom. Yeah. And I tell him, Sly would destroy Lamar Odom <laughs> talent-wise. Yeah. It was just incredible, the talent that he had as a player. I said, he was probably the most talented player ever to step foot on URI campus. I said, so I said, that, that would be my top five. You know, and everybody says, well, you know, you're not putting yourself, you're being modest. I said, no, I just believe that that would be my top five because I believe that those guys, that five that I've said, deserve it more than I do. No. And I'm okay with that. It's not a big, it's, I tell everybody, it's, it's, honestly, it's not a big thing for me. But what is a big thing for me that somebody besides those three that are there now from these past couple generations have to be up there. Because when you bring kids in on recruiting trips, if I'm a kid coming to the gym on a recruiting trip and I look up in the Raptors and I see three, yeah. three jerseys retired, I'm like, okay, so if I come here and I just break every record, we go to the tournament, we, you know, we go to the tournament my four years and I break every record possible, my name or my jersey is not going to be retired. Yeah. You know, and I and you know, and I had the discussion with Thor, and I told him I said it's if you study power four, power five um, high school kids into this program on a consistent basis, it's it seems it seems meal, but it's important. Sure, I said yeah. because when we go, when you go, and I told him I said when you go to all these other st- um gyms, I said when you look up, you see names and jerseys retired. Yeah. I said, it's, it's celebrating the history of your program. Exactly. Why don't we do that? It's 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 interesting, and I it, that proves a good point where you want to see that because my perspective. I mean, I'm not I'm nothing more than a mediocre rec ball player, but when I <laughs> when I look up at the rafters and I see Michelle Will, uh, Washington, I have no no. If that's I hopefully I didn't butcher her name, but I didn't know who yeah. she was. I, I didn't know what the yeah. name was, and. Ernie Calvary, I knew of him sort of, and obviously Frank Keeney sure. is, you know, the sure. fa- uh, godfather of Rhode Island basketball, college wise. Sure. But I would like to see that because then you see, you look up whether you're doing stats for something or another thing, you see these players who have put stuff, time into it, effort into it, success. Sure. So, like yourself or these other players, and you would like to see that because I think it definitely helps they bring in players that aren't just two star recruits, three star recruits. And there's nothing wrong with that but it, it, it helps you know bring in more talent so you're not scrambling in a situation nowadays with a transfer before we get to the one word yeah. challenge i want to ask you this question with the time we have left and i appreciate how long you've been here with me but now at the nfl had the all 100 team and they have all this stuff and they the week long talking about this and then these players and why they were great in a situation and maybe it's just the sweet 16 team versus the lead eight team but I'm curious if an all-time five-on-five game, who are your four players and who are the other five you're playing? Or is that too hard? No, not at all. I take, I take our 88 team against the 98 team and we whip their ass. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? And that's just, you know what? Like I said, that 98 team was a tremendous team. Oh God, were they? They were a tremendous team. But I truly believe that my 88 team they wouldn't be able to hand. They wouldn't be able to hang with us, and that's that's just me being a little sure. biased. No, oh, yeah. But I I wouldn't I wouldn't take anybody off my team and put somebody else on. Now I take my ADA team over anybody in school's history. No no questions asked. 
I'm curious because you know I was you know born in 2000, so I, I missed that that team as well. But what was what was what separated though your team your year that team the 88 team from that 98 team? Right, so the 98 team had a deeper bench than we did. Sure. Um, we legitimately played that 88 year seven seven players. Okay. So. Um, but what really separated us, I don't think it was much. Honestly, I don't think it was sure. much. They had as much grit, as much desire to win. Um, it was very similar teams. Oh, my God. I mean, they had, their backcourt was one of the best backcourts in the, in the country. Our backcourt was one of the best backcourts in the country. Um, they, had a, they had a tremendous supporting cast. Um, we had a great supporting cast for Tommy and Silk. So, I don't think there's much that really separated us. I mean, sure. that's just me being biased, saying that we would win everything. Yeah. Well, that's confidence. And you hope that everyone has yeah. that when, the, when, the, <laughs> when they're playing. Now, I want to end talking with this, this little game, this little segment I have called the one word challenge. So what I do is for people okay. don't know what it is. I take five, six, seven, in this case, seven topics, people, places, names. That's something to do with my okay. guests. And what my guest has to do is do their best to try and na- think of a word or two or even a sentence that best describes that thing. Are you ready? Okay, sure. Uh, John Chaney. The greatest basketball coach I've ever met. Holy Cross. Love it to death. Keeney Jim. Home. Tommy Penders. Great. Overseas basketball. Special. You or I. Home. And start at last but certainly not least, Kenny Green. Just a humble man, just trying to get through life. <laughs> aren't, aren't we all, especially nowadays? Well, Kenny, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time with me to do this. Thank you for jumping up to the opportunity and doing it 24 hours later. I, that shows the type of character you have. It, it means a lot. And Thank hearing you. the stories, hearing the stories about the greatness that your teams had and what it brought to the program. And it, it, it's very inspiring. I'm very appreciative to have alumni of the school and players who want to do this and help out with people and take the time to recant old memories. So it, it means, means a great deal. No, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate you asking me to come on anything that I can do to help. I, I, you've got me. Well, thank you. Um, now, as I always do, I like to promote plug, put anything out there. So if you have anything that you would like to put out there or share, you certainly have the floor. If, if you don't, that's okay as well. Whoever's coming in for coaching, I'm ready to be on your staff. Yeah. Well, yeah, get this on here. You, you have the talent here and to not get these <laughs> damn alumni on the team. I mean, the, the, the people who they in, retire their numbers or names, they should be some on the short list to be hired, but I'm not, I'm not it getting, great. I'm not, I'm not the person in charge of this. I'm not Thor. I don't get, I get paid nothing to show the games, although I've been to enough games. Anyways, if you want more news and updates regarding the podcast, follow on Twitter, Nolan Carr Night, on Instagram, Nolan Carr Night Show. Like, subscribe, share, comment, follow that great stuff. So hopefully down the road, hopefully when the, the team's you know better, you know, you look back on this episode and say, holy crap, this episode with the one and only Kenny Green was amazing. And down the, just that would appreciate. And in the words of Johnny Carson, I bid you a heartfelt good night. Until next week, we see each other again. Take care. Mm-hmm.